he refuses. They were just a lot of evil people. They had beaten a black guy to death in the L-Trex, and they said, it's only a What's the big deal? And that was like one of those turning points where it just, for whatever reason, really got me angry. Now I just want nothing more to do with these people. Cooley decides to quit, but no one leaves the mob. They destroyed other people who didn't do what they were told, and now they're going to kill me. Cooley decides to take the biggest gamble of his life. He will fight the mob. By the mid-1980s, Mafia attorney Bob Cooley can no longer endure the mob's relentless brutality. But if he leaves, they will kill him. Cooley decides to attack the outfit. His closest target is their political fixer, Pat Marcy. Without him, the mob has little protection from the law. On Saturday, March 8th, 1986, Cooley goes to see the FBI. I went to the FBI strike force, the organized crime strike force, and I said, look, I'd like to maybe help try to clean up the court system. March 20th, 1986, in a hotel room 15 miles outside the city, the feds record Cooley's story. He explains how Secretary Pat Marcy, a made member of the mafia, controls Chicago's judges, politicians, and police force. The feds think he must have a death wish. They said, you know, are you okay? Are you sick? And I said, no, I'm not sick. But why do you want to do this? And I said, it's just something that I want to do. But Marcy is such a powerful public figure that the feds don't believe Cooley's story. In desperation, he offers to wear a wire. Even as I left the building, I'm starting to think to myself, I committed suicide. I, I have no idea if I have signed my own death warrant as I walked out of there. Wearing a small tape recorder strapped to his back, Cooley starts gathering evidence against Pat Marcy. I wired him up dozens and dozens of times to send him to meetings with organized crime people. The operation is codenamed Gambit, short for gambling attorney, a reference to Cooley's taste for gambling and to the risk he's taking. If found out, he would be savagely tortured and killed. Over the next three years, Cooley doggedly gathers evidence against crooked judges and politicians in the outfit's pay. June 5, 1989, Cooley meets Fred Roti to discuss a legal matter. Cooley's brother, a real estate lawyer, requires a zoning change in the first ward, Marcy's territory. We sat down and he said, well, what's this all about? And I said, well, look, these people want to build, they want to do some renovation of some buildings, they want this and they want that, how big a project? I said, oh, I think it's a million, million and a half, something like that. Just then, Marcy walks in. Yeah, Marcy right away takes over. Uh, what's this all about? How big is it? Who's the builder? And uh, they know the rules, they know they've got to pay. And, uh, and I said, well, Pat, I just want to know how much. Marcy wants $7,500 for himself and Roti. I wanted to put money in both of their hands, uh, you know, just to make it an even bigger case. Cooley records both men asking for and receiving their payoff, enough proof to convict them. He now goes after other corrupt members of Marcy's inner circle. Wearing the wire, he meets with Marcy to discuss a bribe for a crooked judge. To avoid being overheard, the two men step outside. When we go to walk in, being the gentleman that Pat is, he goes to escort me in and puts his hand right on the wire. Right on the wire. Cooley's mind is racing as they reach the table. He sat down and I stood there and I started complaining about my back. I, I stood there and I said, oh, you know, oh, man. I said, you know, oh, I said, I've got this brace. I said, I got this brace, but it's not helping any. My back is, my back is killing me. You know, I'm not going to, you know, I, mean, I, I wanted to get out of there. And I just said, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to, I got to go, Pat. I'm going to go see my doctor or whatever. And I left. Marcy believes him. Cooley presses on. 
recording conversations with First Ward regulars. Finally, he collects enough evidence to potentially destroy the outfit's treacherous politicians. Cooley's job is done and disappears into the witness protection program. I left town in November of 89. There wasn't a single mob killing for almost nine years afterwards. They didn't all suddenly just decide to stop killing. They realized they couldn't get away with it. October 19, 1990, Operation Gambit blows apart the outfit's power base in the first ward. Judges, lawyers, and politicians are found guilty. Among them is the mob's master fixer, Pat Marcy. He's indicted for conspiracy, racketeering, bribery, and extortion. He suffers a heart attack during the trial and later dies. Alderman Fred Roti is jailed for four years for conspiracy, bribery, and racketeering. Judge Wilson, who accepted a bribe to acquit Harry Aylman of murder 12 years earlier, cannot face being ruined by his ties to the mob. He commits suicide. But Cooley isn't finished yet. From his witness protection hideaway, he persuades the state attorney to re-examine the application of the double jeopardy rule and retry Harry Aylman. Under the law, we have a right to go forward and prosecute this case a second time because the first trial, due to the bribery, was a sham and that Mr. Alleman was never in jeopardy. Aylman becomes the first man in American history ever to be retried for murder. He is found guilty and sentenced to a staggering 100 to 300 years in prison. Following Cooley's undercover work, the corrupt first ward is exposed, and the court system is reformed to change the way judges are appointed. For the feds, it's a major victory against the mob. I'm very proud of the work uh, Bob did. He did a fabulous job. He probably was one of the best uh, in, in producing information that uh, the Chicago uh, FBI office has had. For the first time since the jailing of Al Capone in 1932, the outfit suffers a major defeat. Operation Gambit breaks the mob's links to Chicago's government, law enforcement, and judiciary. But it fails to tie the corruption directly to the mafia leadership, and the feds cannot touch them. But then, a surprising and unexpected letter arrives from a federal prison. By 1990, the FBI exposes the Mafia's corrupt influence on Chicago's legal and political institutions. But the outfit's leaders escape indictment. The feds must find a way to bring them down. In 1992, the outfit's top boss, Tony Accardo, dies. It's rumored that former crew boss, Joey the Clown Lombardo, takes his place. The outfit's style starts to change violent street crews draw too much attention and the recent indictments and legalized riverboat gambling have battered the mob and its profits a new generation of mobsters with university degrees begins to operate with greater sophistication they have put their money where they can hide it and so they own construction companies trucking companies bars restaurants waste hauling companies and they're not as obvious as they were. But the Mafia has not abandoned its core businesses. If a human being wants to buy a prostitute uh, or drugs uh, or uh, wants a bookmaker or wants a juice loan, it's still going to be available in Chicago. They're going to provide those vices. The outfit still makes about $100 million a year from people's weaknesses. The federal authorities must put an end to this ruthless exploitation. That means jailing the syndicate's leaders. But these shadowy figures are never linked to any crime, which makes it impossible for the feds to convict them until they get help from a totally unexpected quarter. On August 18, 1998, FBI agent Tom Bourgeois receives a surprising letter. 
It's from a jailed mobster, Frank Calabresi Jr. He tells Bourgeois, I want to help you and the government. Nobody, not even my lawyers, know I'm sending you this letter. It's better that way, for my safety. Well, when we got the letter, we went to see him, and he spoke to us. He gave us information in regards to specific types of, 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 of crimes that we were interested in. Frank, his father, and his uncle are in jail for loan sharking and extortion. He's prepared to disclose dark family secrets in exchange for a reduced sentence. He tells the feds about a murder planned by his father and carried out by his uncle, Nick Calabresi. The victim is mobster John Fecarata. September 14, 1986. Nick Calabresi goes for a drive with Fecarata. Calabresi shoots Fecarata in the head, but only wounds him. Fecarata tries to escape his execution. Calabresi has to finish the job in the street. When he kills him, he is wearing rubber gloves, and Nick pulls off the rubber gloves and throws him by a dumpster as he's leaving. The cops find the gloves and store them. DNA technology is not available yet. May 1999. Acting on Frank Jr.'s tips, the feds pay Nick Calabresi a visit in jail. The feds have a warrant to take a DNA sample. If it proves he is the killer, he could spend the rest of his life in jail. He was very scared. If the mob knew that we knew he was the murderer in a mob hit, he's got a real dilemma. He's between a rock and a hard place. He's either going to help us or they're going to kill him. Nick Calabresi turns informant. He's the first made member of the mafia to do so. His revelations are sensational. He was a treasure trove of information about the mob. He discussed being involved personally with numerous murders. Finally, the feds have what they've needed for decades, an insider's testimony that will destroy the outfit's leaders. They launch Operation Family Secrets. Red Wamet is a key witness in the investigation. He began working for the outfit in the late 1960s. After only three years, he couldn't take the sadistic violence any longer. They took advantage of people that couldn't defend themselves. They never went after somebody that was going to hurt them. Wamet becomes an FBI informant. For 18 years, he leads a dangerous double life, secretly recording mafia conversations. His evidence can put some of the most notorious outfit killers away for life. He is currently in the witness protection program. In April 2005, after a seven-year investigation, Operation Family Secrets smashes the mob's leadership. Fourteen of its highest-ranking bosses are indicted. Among them, Chairman Joey the Clown Lombardo. The defendants are all men who have committed brutal crimes for the outfit. They are indicted for 18 murders going back nearly 40 years, including the 1974 murder of federal witness Daniel Seifert. On September 27, 2007, Lombardo was convicted of killing Seifert. He faces spending life in prison. The family secrets convictions decimate the Chicago Mafia leadership but it isn't dead. I don't believe that those of us who worked organized crime for years and years and years would ever state that we have eliminated anything. Mobsters may still walk the streets of the city, but their grip on its institutions is broken. The outfit is a pale reflection of what it once was. The people of Chicago and its law enforcement have reclaimed their city. They must now hold on to it.